Thank you so much for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm Ephraim Graham. Ahead today, President Biden's big decision. Who will he nominate for the U.S. Supreme Court now that Justice Stephen Breyer is stepping down? We'll explore the question. Members of Congress in both parties are facing threats from other Americans. So what are they doing to protect themselves? We'll show you. Would you put a microchip in your brain? We'll tell you what a new poll found about that question. Plus... Christians in China have been facing tremendous persecution. The Chinese Communist government wants to control the hearts and minds of the people. And they see a follower of Jesus Christ as a direct threat. We'll explore how this could affect Christians at the upcoming Beijing Olympics. And later, we'll show you a beautiful discovery off the coast of Israel of amazing treasures, each separated by 1,000 years. Try to imagine that the ship was wrecked in the Roman period at the site, and then 1,000 years later, another ship was wrecked on, maybe on the top of it or in the air of it. It was really interesting. All these stories and more are coming up now. This is CBN News Watch. We begin with President Joe Biden's big decision. Who will he nominate for the U.S. Supreme Court after reports that 83-year-old Justice Stephen Breyer is set to retire? George Thomas brings us this look at Breyer's record and who might take his place. Justice Breyer and President Joe Biden are expected to announce his retirement at the White House today, paving the way for the president to keep his pledge to nominate the court's first African-American woman. The president has uh, stated and reiterated his commitment to nominating a black woman to the Supreme Court and certainly uh, stands by that. I would like to start uh, by expressing my sincerest gratitude to you, Mr. Chairman. Set to top the list of potential picks is Kantanji Brown-Jackson, who got three Republican votes, including South Carolina's Lindsey Graham, when the Senate confirmed her to the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals last June. Also on the list is Leandra Kruger of the California Supreme Court, J. Michelle Childs, who serves on South Carolina's federal court, and Judge Leslie Abrams Gardner of the U.S. District Court of Georgia. Justice Breyer's departure won't shift the court's 6-3 conservative majority, but does come at a critical time for Democrats, who've been pushing for the 83-year-old senior justice to retire. It comes at a time when the Democrats have the slimmest, uh, the slimmest control of the Senate, where uh, a new justice would have to be confirmed. And that's also just in advance of midterm elections, where that, uh, that majority is very much in question. So help me go. Congratulations, Justice. Breyer was known as a centrist during his 27 years on the bench, but he consistently voted with the liberal wing of the court. One of Judge Breyer's most important cases was in 2000, when he wrote the majority opinion striking down a Nebraska law outlawing partial birth abortion. Human rights campaign, a pro-LGBT group, uh, calling him a, a wonderful hero of the movement. And you just go down the list, Planned Parenthood, the ACLU, uh, all with very, very kind words. Top Senate Democrats say they'll move quickly to confirm Biden's nominee, even if Breyer does not officially step down until the summer. And despite a 50-50 split in the upper chamber, most experts aren't expecting a rancorous fight. We're not going to have the Brett Kavanaugh fireworks, and we're not going to have any of that. Uh, for sure, or even the Amy, Amy Coney Barrett fireworks, and for that matter, not even the Neil Gorsuch fireworks. George Thomas, CBN News. Reserve is getting ready to take on inflation. As expected, the Fed announced Wednesday it will start raising interest rates in March. Chairman Jerome Powell said he believes inflation will start falling in the months ahead. So there are multiple forces which should be working over the course of the year for inflation to come down. But Powell acknowledged that inflation has lasted less than the Fed had expected. Some analysts believe the Fed waited too long to take on inflation, while others worry the Fed could raise rates too quickly and slow down the economy. Also in Washington, members of Congress in both parties are facing threats from other Americans. Capitol Police say they are committed to keeping Congress safe, but severe staffing shortages have them treading water to keep up with the threats. As CBN national security correspondent Caitlin Burke reports, that has some lawmakers turning to private security for help. The number of threats against members of Congress has tripled since 2017, with nearly 10,000 reported just last year. Many come in the form of verbal assaults. A member of Congress was threatened in a gruesome voicemail 
that asked if she had ever seen what a 50 caliber shell does to a human head. Another member of Congress, an Iraq War veteran and Purple Heart recipient, received threats that left her terrified for her family. Attorney General Merrick Garland says we can't risk this kind of action becoming normalized. That is dangerous for people's safety, and it is deeply dangerous for our democracy. While U.S. Capitol Police is tasked with protecting lawmakers, Chief Tom Manger says they face a shortage of nearly 450 agents. We're going to have to nearly double the number of agents that work those um, uh, threat cases. Uh, we've increased the number over the last couple of years by necessity, but even now, it needs to be increased even more. Despite that level of security, some lawmakers have sought outside protection. That means having, um, doing, doing intelligent research before events. It means identifying people who are sending you, um, sending you hate mail. You're building security into your day-to-day into your day-to-day -day life. Chris Ryan with K2 Integrity has helped oversee both physical and online security for political clients. He blames the growth in these threats on a general increase in misbehavior. You're seeing a level of, uh, of behavior across the population that you just never really saw before. And whether it's you know built up frustration from, uh, from COVID uh, or just a general coarsening of, of American society. Nobody really knows exactly what's happening, but there's no doubt that it that it is happening, and it's certainly happening in politics. He advises elected officials to make security a priority beginning on day one. Typically, you know, security firms get drawn in when something has already happened, and we are now reacting to something as to being proactive. So we advise everyone, be proactive in your security. Ryan calls the angry political rhetoric coming from both the American public and politicians extremely dangerous. Unfortunately, he sees no indication of this current trend easing up, especially with the 2022 midterms just around the corner. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. I want to turn now to an issue that often has bipartisan support, protecting religious freedom, which is increasingly under attack in America. A new group is looking to recruit lawmakers who will stand for the free exercise of religion at the local, state, and national levels, regardless of political party. Jenna Browder brings us the story. I was a coach here for eight years. Yeah. Washington State High School football coach Joe Kennedy fired for his post-game prayers. A Christian photographer forced to pay thousands of dollars, go to jail, and have her business license revoked for refusing to take photos for same-sex weddings. At Health and Human Services, a leaked memo revealing the Biden administration seeks to unenforce the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. They target religious foster care agencies, homeless shelters, bakers and florists, hospitals and schools. They even attack nuns who care for the sick and the dying. The Religious Freedom Institute says these threats can't go unchecked. Former Religious Freedom Ambassador Sam Brownback on CBN's Faith Nation. The, one of the rights that God gave to us, I mean, he gave us religious freedom. He gave us the right to choose to do with our own soul what we choose. And no government has the right to interfere with that. Brownback is spearheading the organization's new National Committee for Religious Freedom. The committee aiming to help elect politicians at all levels and regardless of party who will stand for religious liberty. Each state will have a chapter. So there'll be a Virginians for Religious Freedom, a Kansans for Religious Freedom, Californians for Religious Freedom. And we'll ask those local uh, state affiliates to determine the major issues in their state and local governance that they want to look at. So it's bipartisan, as you've mentioned, that it's, you know, it's regardless of party. Um, are you hopeful that you'll get people from both parties? I am. You know, this used to be a solidly bipartisan issue. The Religious Freedom Restoration Act, when it initially passed, I think it passed the Senate 99 to 1. There wasn't any division on the First Amendment to the Constitution, the free exercise of religion. But since then, it's divided up a lot more, not internationally. We've stayed together there, yeah. but domestically we have. And my hope is that we can start pulling together here saying this is a fundamental right that you cannot have a diverse culture without having these protections for people of faith. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. 
Now for a story that sounds like a page out of science fiction, would you put a microchip in your brain? Uh, John Zogby Strategies nationwide online poll recently asked, is it the next level of human evolution life improving or do you worry it will bring humanity under totalitarian control? 77% said they worry the chip implants will usher in a never before seen level of totalitarian control. Only 10% said it will improve lives. You can find more in-depth reporting on this poll and who is more likely to say they would be willing to merge with artificial intelligence at CBNNews.com. Coming up, Christians were persecuted during, during the 2008 Olympics in Beijing. The pastors that we met with on that visit, uh, as the Olympic Games got closer, he was detained. He was held throughout the Games and held a few days after the Games. See more on what happened and if the upcoming Beijing Olympics will be better for Christians in China. That's coming up after the break. Stay with us. Christians in China say they are facing the worst persecution in that country since the days of Chairman, Chairman Mao. So what about with what's going to happen with the Olympics? Are they doing any better as the communist government tries to present a positive image to the world? Christian leaders went missing from their families last time China hosted the global competition. So what about this time? Todd Nettleton of The Voice of the Martyrs responds to that question on this week's episode of The Global Link. That is a great question, and I think some of that we will find out in the weeks to come, probably after the Olympics. As you mentioned, uh, it has been known to happen. I know I was in China before the 2008 Olympics, and one of the pastors that we met with on that visit, uh, as the Olympic Games got closer, he was detained. He was held throughout the Games and held a few days after the Games uh, to keep him from reaching out to Westerners to keep his story from being told as part of that Olympic coverage. Uh, so certainly as we get closer and closer, it is a key and strategic time to pray for our Christian brothers and sisters in China. And this treatment's really nothing new, right? Because many Chinese Christians say government control of their churches and lives has gotten worse in recent years. Yeah, it has gotten dramatically worse. It, it, it has become a surveillance state. Uh, the cameras are everywhere. The cameras are watching. They're hooked to facial recognition technology. Uh, and this is coming from the national level. You know, 10 years ago, we would say, hey, in this province of China, there's heavy persecution. But look over in this province, the church is operating without a lot of interference. Today, we can say it is happening in every part of China. It is driven by the national government. President Xi Jinping was formerly a provincial leader. His province was one of those known for heavy persecution of Christians. And so he has brought that to the national level now. And this is being orchestrated by Beijing all over the country. Even Christians communicating online, uh, on social media and so forth, organizing uh, meetings or prayer groups, uh, they're coming under attack. Tell us about that, Todd. Yeah, the government is constantly monitoring the online activity of China's citizens, including our Christian brothers and sisters there. And so uh, they are tamping down on online worship activities, online Christian activities. You can no longer order a Bible online in China. Uh, they, <laughs> you know, the Chinese communist government wants to control the hearts and minds of the people. And they see a follower of Jesus Christ as a direct threat because someone who says, my first priority is following Jesus, obviously their first priority is not being a good communist. And so uh, Christians are seen as a threat, their message is seen as a threat, and the government is doing everything in their power to keep that message from spreading. Okay, back to the Olympics now. I know Open Doors CEO David Curry is urging people, especially people of faith, to not watch the Olympics on television. Uh, low ratings, I guess, would send a clear message to Beijing about its religious freedom and human rights violations. I know VOM's taking another approach, China Prayer 2022. Please explain. Well, we know that uh, many people will be watching the Olympic Games. You know, some will choose not to, some will choose to watch. For all of those, though, we hope that the Olympic coverage is a reminder to pray for Christians in China. You know, we're going to see uh, events, we're gonna see figure skating, we're gonna see ski jumping. We'll probably see a lot of great shots of the Great Wall of China. We want every one of those things to be a reminder. Hey, I have Christian brothers and sisters in China who are suffering 
because of the name of Jesus Christ, this is a great time to pray for them. And so we have set up a website, Pray for China. 2022.com. We're encouraging people to say, hey, yes, I'm going to pray for Chinese Christians every day during the Olympics. You can register on the site. There's some tools to help you share on the site. There's some specific ways we can pray. Uh, but again, the, the key is we're going to use the Olympics as a reminder, a daily reminder to pray for our brothers and sisters in China. And, and what specifically should our viewers be praying? What do the Chinese Christians say? How can we pray? You know, one of the great challenges and great lessons for us is their prayer request is not pray that we won't suffer anymore, pray that the persecution will end. Their prayer request is pray that we'll be faithful to Christ in spite of the persecution. Uh, but we can certainly pray for a sense of encouragement for Chinese brothers and sisters. We can pray for God's protection over them, protection from their own government. We can also pray especially for those like Pastor Wang Yi who are currently in prison because of their faith in Christ. Okay, the website again, PrayForChina2022.com, correct? Yep, that's correct. Okay, Todd Nettleton of The Voice of the Martyrs, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. For more on this stories and other trends happening in the world, be sure to check out The Global Lane. You can watch it on the CBN News Channel at 8.30 Eastern Standard Time this evening. You can also find it on demand by using the CBN News app. Still ahead, two amazing ancient discoveries that left amazing treasures under the sea. Find out what they are coming up next. A fascinating discovery off the coast of Israel is yielding spectacular treasures. Two shipwrecks in the same site, separated by a thousand years, have left Roman and Jewish artifacts scattered across the ocean floor. These ancient discoveries are giving us a glimpse into the world of the early church. Chris Mitchell has the story now from Jerusalem. At the entrance of the harbor of Caesarea, divers from the Israel Antiquities Authority made a rare discovery. To find two different shipwrecks mixed together on the same site in a different of one, more than 1,000 years. To try to imagine that the ship was wrecked in the Roman period at the site, and then 1,000 years later, another ship was wrecked on, maybe on the top of it or in the air of it, it was really interesting. In one area, Charvit and his partner found both bronze coins from the third century and silver coins from the 14th century. They are amazing, actually, from uh, our point of view, because they are telling a story. It's not only the artifacts, it's the whole story of all the shipwreck. What is the ship we're doing there? Uh, the period, what was the position or the situation of what was happening with the ship? The treasures also included a bronze eagle figurine, a symbol of Roman rule, and a red gemstone with the carving of a lyre, or what's known as David's harp. In the book of 1 Samuel from the Bible, it says David played his harp for King Saul. They also found a gold ring with the reference from the New Testament. This is the Good Shepherd ring found in the shipwrecks in the Mediterranean, and it helps tell the story of early Christians in the city of Caesarea during the Roman Empire. As we know, the symbol of the Good Shepherd is one of the first symbols of uh, Jesus, and uh, actually the idea of the Good Shepherd was um, adopted by the most of the local population who actually were looking forward into the new religion because in the Old Testament we actually have the reference to the Good Shepherd and his herd. The ring also tells a story about Christians from Caesarea nearly 1,700 years ago. To find a ring from the third century when Christianity basically was still underground. Christians were persecuted during the third century. It's only a hundred years later under Constantine that, Christian, that Christianity becomes a state religion. So this is a ring of a, a Christian who lived in a period that Christians were still persecuted and killed, even in Caesarea. I think we have a pretty dramatic find here. Very simple, very laconic, just the male figure bearing the lamb on his shoulders. Almost exactly the same uh, image we can see on the walls of the catacombs in Rome, in the area where actually the services took place. The artifacts, coins, and ring help reconstruct the puzzle of Caesarea's past. The ring is fantastic, of course. I mean, we often find coins from the Roman period. You know, archaeology is like a puzzle. You take different elements, and the wonderful thing in archaeology is that 
you can piece things together. You know, we have the site, we have the coins, we have the ship, and then this beautiful ring, and everything suddenly comes together. The ring also makes a personal connection. This ring connects you to the people, right? Like, especially when you find something, I'm talking about just myself, when I see something like that, it's something which is very personal in a way, right? You try to imagine the particular person who was wearing this ring, what were his thoughts or beliefs. It's really touching. I'm not a religious person by myself, but when I see something like that, I feel this connection to someone who lived hundreds and hundreds of years ago. The discoveries also reveal the port of Caesarea had a longer history than previously thought. Because some of the people, or some of the archaeologists, were thinking that the uh, harbor was collapsed in the first century AD. Now we realize that the commerce and the ship were coming from all over the Mediterranean, also to Caesarea, in a later period, especially in the uh, late Roman and early Byzantine periods. Caesarea played a prominent role in the early church. The Book of Acts documents the first Christian baptism of a non-Jew happened there, and from Caesarea, the Apostle Paul helped take the gospel to the world. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, the Laboratories of the Israel Antiquities Authority, Jerusalem. Coming up, an encouraging word to get you through the day. It is your Thursday Thankful. Coming up next, stay with us. Welcome back to your Thursday Thankful. I want to leave this message with you. It's a message of gratitude and a prayer of faithfulness, even in the face of difficult times. I'm grateful for pain. It's a reminder that I'm not perfect, but I am progressing. It also builds my ability to find God's peace in the middle of problems. Hope you'll join me in this prayer of gratitude and make today a Thursday filled with thanksgiving. That is going to do it for this edition of CBN News Watch. I want to remind you, you can always find more of our news programs on the CBN News Channel. You can find them there at any time as well as online at CBNNews.com. Let us know what you think about the stories you've seen here today or any day. You can email us, newswatch at CBN.com. The address is right there at the bottom of your screen. You can also reach out and touch us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We certainly hope you'll join us again right here next time. Make it a thankful Thursday. We look forward to seeing you right back here, same time tomorrow. Goodbye and God bless.